Hey everyone, my name is Perry. I'm an electrical engineer and in this video we're going to watch Dr. Stone Season 3 Episode 1 to see how accurate all the science and technology in this anime really are. The only reason I'm being as picky as I would be is just Dr. Stone gets everything correct. I mean, the producers and the writers really do their research here. The question I have is if somebody is in a petrified state like that, just a coma for example, don't their muscles atrophy? Because their heart still has to beat and their lungs still have to, you know, push air and circulate throughout their body, otherwise they're gonna go through organ failure. That's Really the only thing I can think of in Dr. Stone that's just so inaccurate is just the how did he survive? But I'm also not through this season. Maybe they explain it. I mean, that's, that's the only thing I have against the scientific accuracy for this anime. <laughs> One thing I can absolutely promise is back in the stone age like this, or stone world rather, not a single person is gonna be picky with the, like, I wanna be on a keto diet or vegetarian, vegan, lactose-free. The only dietary restriction that exists in this world is, do I have food today or not? It, it is that extreme. Like, th this is something where if you see a goat, just walking down a path, you're literally seeing breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the next couple of days on four hooves walking away from you. You better go get that, otherwise you're not eating. It's not as if you're living in a city where you can have Chinese food, Indian food, or Italian food, whatever cuisine you want just on the street because it's all available to you. This is a really, really sucky time to live. I mean, I really like where we are right now. We've solved the food crisis. That's a really big deal. I mean. How many like animals, species of any kind can actually grow and store their own food? I can't think of any, let me know in the comments if there's anything like that, but that is one of the big reasons that human civilization has grown so much. Like we've actually solved our food problem. In the world today, nobody is starving due to lack of crops or lack of food grown on the planet. They're starving because of political pressure. I promise you there's more than enough food that is grown every year to feed the planet. That is really, really clever, and that's a great memory for him to just you know, keep all of that back there. Because I don't know when the last time it was that in Dr. Stone they used calcium carbonate, which is what seashells are made of, to actually you know, implement for anything. But this is certainly realistic. I mean, you can buy this as fertilizer for your garden today. Adding seashells to the soil will actually change the texture and it'll allow for the plants to absorb a lot more nutrients that they're gonna need, which is vital for their growth, and it's gonna grow faster and stronger. Human innovation is really, really fast. I mean, I don't know how long after we started growing these crops this way that somebody said, how can I do this, but way faster, <laughs> right? I mean. It's probably five minutes after we made the first car, the idea of racing cars began. <laughs> this is super cool, and yeah, it's absolutely true that you can't just grow any crops or plants wherever you feel like it. There's a lot of variables you have to consider, especially being you know the quality of the soil, which after like 3,000 years or however long they've been petrified, I'm willing to bet a lot of the soil that has been ruined by human interaction with it is completely fine now and you can farm in many more places than you were able to before. One thing to certainly look out for is irrigation because if you're gonna farm at such a mass scale, you've gotta water these plants all the time to continuously grow them. One thing that's going to happen again and repeat itself, even in the stone world moving forward, unless they, you know, cure it right now or solve this problem, is monocrop agriculture being really detrimental to the soil. 
you're not supposed to, but by you, I mean like farmers in general, I'm not knocking them or anything because I love food, right? And it's a very effective way of growing it and farming the food because you can use the same tools for a large area. But for the quality of the soil, it's not natural to grow just rows and rows of apple trees or oranges or, you know, uh, wheat or corn because every one of these plants is competing for the same nutrients in the same patch of soil. Eventually, it's gonna run out. <laughs> Moving along this theme for food and the whole monocrop agriculture, there, there's so much to this that even I myself, I'm surprised I even have this information in me, but there are certain plants that are considered complementary to each other and there are certain plants that you cannot grow next to each other and one thing that Senku pointed out was that wheat doesn't grow in acidic soil so when you sprinkle the calcium on it you actually change the landscape so that it allows for certain crops to grow while certain crops cannot. Another example is planting carrots and potatoes next to each other is not a good idea because they're both rooting crops. One or both of them is not going to get the amount of phosphorus it needs to grow to full maturity and both are going to suffer as a result. Planting carrots and onions next to each other is a really good idea because the onion plant will actually repel carrot rust flies which will allow the carrots to grow to their full maturity and now you have your pest control problem solved. That's something that I predict will probably come up here is that locusts suck and bugs in general will just annihilate entire crops or mice or whatever have you. Another companion crop for the carrot are tomatoes. The reason that they're completely okay to plant right next to each other, and I mean in really, really close proximity to each other, is because carrots grow below the ground, onions grow above the ground, so you don't actually have that same competition for the literally the same space like potatoes and carrots do. Now contrastly, if you plant corn and tomatoes next to each other, you're almost going to guarantee that all these tomatoes are about to die because corn attracts tomato pests. So if you look anywhere in the world, you will never see corn and tomatoes in mass numbers next to each other because they are adversarial plants. There's so much going on in terms of you want certain flowers to be next to the plants because they attract bees, which will pollinate. Then you want other stuff like asparagus does certain things and depending on how they flower, like mint is invasive, but it attracts like earthworms, which do other stuff to the soil. There are so many things that go into this and they're not gonna face these problems immediately, but the more you create this monocrop agriculture sort of lifestyle, the more these problems will emerge and constantly pumping fertilizer and nitrogen into the soil is only gonna work for so long Mother Nature just has a way of coming full circle. What Senku said about the type of wheat also matters because you can have different species of tomatoes, different species of carrots, and I mean like apricots, peaches, oh my god, like crab apples, green apples, red apples, honey crisp, whatever, right? This stuff goes on like for, for a lifetime of lists. They gotta worry about altitude, temperature, all this sort of nonsense, right? But who knows, like maybe he has it all figured out and we're about to find out in future episodes of season three. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and I wish you all the best rest of your day.